Okay, so we're going to pick up with facilitated glucose transport, which is basically the response that's made in a cell when that cell binds to this receptor. Um, so you can actually kind of see that process over here. Insulin <coughs> binds to the insulin receptor. We have in-cell signaling leading towards the translocation of this transporter called GLUT4. And there's actually several different types of glucose transporters, but specifically GLUT4 in response to insulin, which then just starts to pick up glucose and brings it inside of the cell. Uh, and so what I want to do is I want to talk through the different types of glucose transports. I'm going to use five types. GLUT4 is what we're going to be looking for for insulin signaling. So the five types, the first one is GLUT1. Um, and GLUT1 is actually a protein that's present in all of our tissues. And it has a really high affinity to bind glucose. And as it's present in all of the tissues, this is actually one of the main mechanisms to allow glucose into all of our different cell types because that glucose is going to be utilized in the production pathway for ATP. And so this really facilitates what I'm going to refer to as basal glucose uptake. So the uptake or the um, intake of glucose into all of our cells for that basic ATP production process. Now, glucose is also required for the brain, but you'll remember that the brain is protected by a blood-brain barrier. This is a system of cells that regulates what gets into the brain, what gets into the nervous tissue. It's actually going to be GLUT1 that will be uh, present to aid in the movement of glucose into the into the brain and the spinal cord. It aids in that blood brain barrier. A second subtype of the glucose transporter is GLUT2. And GLUT2 has a much lower affinity for glucose. We find GLUT2 located specifically in hepatic cells, liver cells, and then also in the beta cells of the pancreas. Now, glucose 2, with its low affinity, that means we have to have really high levels of glucose before we'll initialize any sort of transport. Uh, and so this is a glucose transporter that will have um, some kind of redundancy and backup, if you will, when we are under really high glucose levels. For example, hyperglycemia. Okay, so this is an additional mechanism that can help us greatly protect uh, remaining hyperglycemic for long periods of time. So GLUT1, GLUT2, and then GLUT3. Transport under, transport under high glucose levels. This is the main glucose transporter in the udder of pigs. Pigs don't have udders. GLUT3 is um, just another high affinity glucose transporter. Find it in all tissues and in neurons. Another glucose transporter that is going to aid in uptake of glucose into all of our tissues. 
Um, so we still have GLUT4 and GLUT5. GLUT4 is what we see with insulin signaling. And so this is a selective glucose transporter initiated under the presence of insulin signaling. And so we're only going to find this in insulin target tissues, which there are primarily three insulin target tissues, skeletal muscle, hepatic cells, and adipose tissue. And in these three target tissues, when the insulin receptor is bound by insulin or an insulin-like molecule, it initiates a series of cellular mechanisms that results in the transport of GLUT4 to the cell surface. Now, GLU4 ends up having actually a medium affinity. So, not a real high affinity, not a real low affinity, but somewhere in the middle. A medium affinity for glucose. Now, I've actually seen a couple different models on how this how this works. Um, this is one of the models where they kind of are like, oh, it's kind of like a glucose, um, a glucose channel. GLUT4, I actually think there's more evidence that GLUT4 works through a mechanism where GLUT4 binds to glucose and then actually is brought back inside the cell. So the protein comes back inside the cell carrying the glucose and it cycles back out to, um, to the membrane after it drops off that, that glucose. So it will sit there and cycle, bringing these glucose molecules into the cell. Um, those three, those, those, those three tissues. All right, our fifth isotype of the GLUT transporters is GLUT5, uh, and we find GLUT5 specifically in the brush border of the small intestine. And this particular glucose transporter has a high affinity, not for glucose, but for fructose. The brush border? That's a good question. Um, so when you look at the small intestine, all right, you have three different sections, right? Duodenum, jejunum, and the ilium. The duodenum is still a section where digestion actively happens and not a lot of absorption. But as you move into the jejunum and the ileum, we need to move uh, digested nutrients. We need to absorb those into the bloodstream or into the lymphatic system. In order to do that, you need a high surface area. And so these cells are heavily ciliated. Um, actually, I, cilia is not even the right term. Um, villi and microvilli. There's so many of them that it almost looks velvety, and that velvety nature uh, is referred to as the brush border. All right, so those are the glucose transporters. Now I want to talk a little bit more specifically about insulin, and in particular, um, well, actually, let me let me not try that again. I want to I want to talk through the individual hormones now that we find in the pancreas. We're going to start out with insulin, how it's secreted, and then we'll start dealing with um, the <clears throat> some of the other hormones as well, and then we'll get into some mechanisms of action. So starting out with insulin, uh, insulin secretion. So we have an increase in secretion of insulin into the bloodstream when glucose levels increase. Okay, so we have sensing cells 
that lead towards the release of insulin into the bloodstream when glucose levels begin to get high. Very simple. On the other side is to reduce the secretion once um, glucose levels are back uh, in normal. And the way that this in, uh, decrease in secretion is going to occur is we're going to have some several feedback loops that are centered around uh, a couple different molecules. One of them is we'll have alpha adrenergic stimulation by catecholamines. And in particular, epinephrine. So as epinephrine levels increase in the organism, and we have this increase in alpha adrenergic stimulation by epinephrine, this will cause insulin to, uh, to reduce secretion. And that actually makes sense. And the reason it makes sense is because when insulin levels are high, you're putting glucose into tissues for storage. Under alpha adrenergic stimulation, you can think about this as being sy sympathetic. The organism goes into sympathetic tone, which means we have to prepare for some sort of action. That means that we have to have glucose out available for tissues that are going to perform that action. So we don't want to have a bunch of insulin that's going to counter the effects of trying to, trying to promote action by, by uh, the organism. So that's one of the mechanisms that will drive down the secretion of insulin. But we have two hormones as well that when their levels increase, they will cause a decrease in, uh, in insulin. And really, these two these two hormones, the somatostat and the glucocorticoid, um, are basically working uh, under uh, regulatory mechanisms when changes are happening. So somatostatin, insulin, somatostatin, and glucagon are all produced by the pancreas. Insulin and glucagon are basically in this perpetual kind of dance with each other, where one of them increases glucose, one of them decreases glucose. And this is how your body is regulating glucose levels. Somatostatin, you can kind of think of this as being like a chaperone where it doesn't allow insulin to become overly handsy, doesn't allow glucagon to become overly handsy, causing their respective action to become proper, because that's going to become a problem. The glucocorticoids, these are being released under stressful situations. Similar to what we see up here with the alpha adrenergic release, the glucocorticoids are, are released in response, things like corticosterone and cortisol, released in response to a stressful stimuli when the organism needs to prepare for some sort of action. So we need glucose levels to begin to elevate so that we can funnel that to the working tissue. So all three of those are going to alter how um, insulin secretion occurs. On the converse of insulin is glucagon. Um, I want to talk a little bit about glucagon here as we progress. So glucagon is a 29 amino acid polypeptide. And its physiological role, roles are basically the opposite of insulin. So glucagon, we have a glucagon receptor, and when that receptor is expressed, which is expressed primarily in the liver and in the adipose tissue, it's going to cause the release of glucose back into the bloodstream, but it's also going to cause uh, some, other, uh, some other reaction, uh, increase in reactions to allow that release of insulin, of glucose into the bloodstream to happen. So in the liver, glucagon will cause an increase in glucose synthesis. 
this is probably coming from either gluconeogenesis or from glycogenolysis. Gluconeogenesis is using non-sugar precursors to generate glucose, so you may use proteins. There's a couple amino acids that have pathways towards glucose, um, so they can be chemically modified. Or uh, we might be breaking down glycogen from the liver cells to release individual monomers of, of glucose. And then this also is going to lead towards the release. So we get higher levels of glucose, individual monomers, and then we release those individual monomers. So that conversion of amino acids and glycerol into glucose is stimulated to the release of glucose by, by uh, glycogen in the glucagon rather in the liver and then the adipose cells, adipose tissue is another target. And in the adipose tissue, we're going to actually increase the release of free acids and glycerol and we also increase lipolysis which is the breakdown of fats Increasing the release of free fatty acids and glycerol, increasing the cell's chemical ability to break down fats. Uh, insulin is actually the potent inhibitor of lipolysis. And so this particular effect is only going to be seen insulin levels are low. Okay, so what about the secretion of glucagon? How are we going to promote release of glucagon into the bloodstream. When epinephrine levels increase, this will result in increases in glucagon, the glucocorticoids, in which this all, all should make sense now, right? Because these are molecules that increase when the organism needs to take some sort of action in response to a stressor. Also, see glucagon is going to be released in the presence of increased gastrointestinal hormone, which the gastrointestinal hormones, these are being released in response to um, satiety or hunger signals, right, the, the drive to eat. So, if we're under low, low glucose levels, expressing glucagon or secreting glucagon actually is beneficial because that allows glucose to come into the bloodstream to expand that gap between. Uh, between meals, 
release in some of the amino acids in the gut will stimulate glucagon release. Those amino acids that are used as precursors to produce glucose. And then interestingly, when you have high levels of glucose, glucagon is actually going to be stimulated in the tree. You would kind of think, oh, that seems a little bit backwards. Is that kind of when insulin is released as well? Yes, it is. However, remember we need to make sure we balance this because glucose is very important that we keep glucose in the bloodstream within that homeostatic range. So if I just increase insulin and I don't really do anything with, gluc with glucagon, with glucagon, my insulin is going to cause a drastic drop in glucose levels. And as I have that drastic drop in glucose levels in the bloodstream, it can send me into hypoglycemic shock or cause other issues. And so I want to make sure that glucagon levels are elevated so that I sit there and I balance between my, set, my, uh, my upper and lower limits of of glucose levels in the bloodstream. If I release isotype 14 of somatostatin, this is a regulator between insulin and glu glu uh, glucagon. I'm going to have an increase in glucagon secretion. An increase in GABA released from the beta cells. GABA we usually think of as a, uh, as a neurotransmitter, but it's also produced uh, in the gamma aminobutyric acid. Uh, and so GABA will stimulate uh, from the pancreas uh, and the beta cells, stimulate glucagon. And then when we have a decrease in insulin, this also results in stimulation of glucagon. Uh, All right, so let's talk a little bit about the mechanism of action here for glucagon. Okay, so you can see receptor, notice glucagon, and then you also have in parentheses epinephrine. We'll get to that in just a second. But you have the receptor. What kind of receptor is it? Well, you can tell right here that it is a G-linked receptor. So we've got G-protein here, and then we're going to activate adenylate cyclase. So already all of you know what kind of uh, system this is. What is it? Cyclic AMP second mesh. Yep. So uh, cyclic AMP is going to be produced, protein kinase A. And then you have all of the biochemistry that's happening over here. So you can see, and hopefully you recognize some of this stuff. So glucose, glucose 6 phosphate, fructose 6 phosphate, fructose 1 6 bisphosphate, um, PEP, which is um, pyroenol pyruvate, pyruvate down here. What is this? Is it Krebs? Is it a cycle? One step back. Glycolysis. All right, so you have some stuff happening here with glycolysis where you can see that I'm actually phosphorylating some of the enzymes that are involved in this process. Okay? Uh, also over here, I'm phosphorylating two enzymes over here, glycogen synthase and glycogen phosphorylase. Okay? And that stimulates basically this uh, chain of events over here to go from glycogen to glucose one, uh, one phosphate that can be converted to glucose six phosphate by glucose six phosphatase to get me into um, into the glycolytic pathway, which I have the ability right to run the glycolytic pathway backwards if I have the right uh, the right concentrations of products and reactants. Okay. 
So we're primarily focusing here on glycogen and the, the, the glycolytic pathway. So storage and changing how we're storing the molecule, and then over here, how we're processing that molecule. So what is this whole bit here about epinephrine? Well, that whole bit there about epinephrine is that glycogen is going to act in conjunction with epinephrine. So, glucagon. Did I say glycogen? Glucagon. Glucagon is going to act in conjunction with epinephrine. Okay? So epinephrine is actually going to prepare that receptor to efficiently bind to glucagon. That receptor is a G subtype S protein linked receptor. like we've already talked through here and that you've been able to detail. This is going to lead to an increase in adenylate cyclase activity. That increase in adenylate cyclase activity increases cyclic AMP, which results in an increase in the active form of protein kinase A. Now, there's another protein in here that also increases its activity. We have an increase in the active form of a protein or an enzyme that's known as phosphorylase. B kinase. Phosphorylase B kinase. And basically what, we're, what we've done here with glucose when glucagon binds to its receptor is we set up a scenario where the phosphorylation of uh, the phosphorylation capacity of the cell is increased. Phosphorylase B kinase. And as we increase the phosphorylation capacity of the cell, as we have phosphorylases and kinases, the big thing, which is this right here that occurs, is we end up with. Glycogen being pushed over to glucose. Okay? So we begin to upregulate the amount of glucose that's present inside the cell, and that begins to be secreted out of, out of the cell into the bloodstream. And this is specifically, in this example up here, uh, a liver cell. Okay? So protein kinase A, and then another protein is that phosphorylase B kinase. Those get turned on, and we start to phosphorylate. Any place you see kind of these big P's here, those are enzymes that are activated by the protein kinase A and the phosphorylase B kinase to begin to process the release of glucose as glucose 1-phosphate from glycogen to get dumped into the glycolytic pathway converted from 1 to 6, and then from 6 up to glucose. All right, so let's kind of put these two hormones um, together now. I want to talk about this thing. I alluded to this earlier, but this idea of the glucagon-insulin 
that. And I'm using that term dance just because you kind of have insulin that kind of takes the lead and then glucagon kind of takes the lead and, and they're kind of sitting there fluctuating uh, within, uh, within the, the organism to balance glucose levels and to keep glucose levels right around where, uh, where they're required for homeostasis, which is 80 to 120 milligrams per deciliter in the blood. And it's really important because with insulin, what happens if you go hypoglycemic, so that's low levels of glucose? You go unconscious. What happens if you go hyperglycemic? You go unconscious. Okay? So it's really important that we keep glucose levels balanced. Because if we don't, we're going to put ourselves into a, into a dangerous state. By the way, um, if you have a friend who's got diabetes and you find them unconscious, what should you do? Why do you give them sugar? Okay, so too low is extremely medically emergent. Okay, being too high, it's, a, it's, it's medically emergent, but the real consequence of high levels of glucose is over a prolonged period of time because it starts to damage the walls of the vessel and you begin to reduce um, the vessel diameter. So if you find someone and they're passed out, they could have too much sugar. And they're really not in that much danger in the immediate. They're in the danger over the long term, but not in the immediate. But if they're too low, they're immediately in danger. Um, it stops diffusing enough glucose into the heart and the brain go through stroke or through a heart attack. So yeah, sugar packet under the tongue. Okay, you got it. You were, you were just right on it. You knew that. All right, so um, glucagon, insulin, dance. We have to have balance here. So there's a system, I'm going to call it a, a balance activation mechanism that exists in mammals and invertebrates. Uh, in vertebrates, not invertebrates, but within vertebrates. And this balance is centered around the phosphorylase enzyme versus a glycogen synthase or synthesis enzyme. Okay. So phosphorylase takes us from glycogen to individual glucose monomers. Glycogen synthase takes us from individual glucose to stored glucose in glycogen. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually give you a model for what all of this looks like and how all of these enzymes are, are regulated. Uh, so we're going to start out with that chemical reaction. Where you have glycogen that's converted over to glucose from glycogen to glucose is the phosphorylase and from glucose to glycogen is glycogen synthase. So that's the basic chemical reaction. Now, to go from inactive to active, to the phosphorylase, to activate that, the active form needs to be, needs to be phosphorylated, or the inactive form needs to be phosphorylated to activate the phosphorylase. Okay, so we have to add on a phosphate. The way that we get this active is by PKA. Okay, so protein kinase A is going to be to activate the phosphorylase. Okay, so if the phosphorylase is inactive, when PKA levels get high, 
we phosphorylate that inactive phosphorylase, and it becomes active phosphorylase, phosphorylated. So PKA, this is this is where we come in from glucagon and epinephrine. And that's how we activate PKA, glucagon and epinephrine interacting with um, with the uh, the glucagon receptor. Over on the other side, in its inactive form, the glycogen synthase is actually phosphorylated. And so to get that active, I have to remove the phosphate. The way that I remove the phosphate is with a phosphatase. So that phosphatase moves the phosphate, and it is now active. Insulin leads towards activation of that phosphatase. Okay? So if I have glucagon and epinephrine, PKA is active, I can activate that phosphorylase, and I'll run glycogen to glucose. If I have insulin, that phosphatase gets activated, I remove the phosphate, and I activate glycogen synthase, and I run in that reverse direction. So the last thing that happens here is some feedback. From insulin, insulin feeds back onto PKA, and has a negative influence on PKA. So if insulin levels are high in the liver cell, or whatever target cell we're in, that will inhibit PKA. PKA can no longer activate that phosphorylase. I no longer run glycogen to glucose. This right here, this is glucagon and epinephrine. Glucagon and epinephrine activates the receptor, leads to PKA. PKA activates the phosphorylase glycogen converted to glucose. On the bottom here, insulin activates a phosphatase that removes the phosphate. Glycogen synthase activates glycogen synthase, runs from glucose to glycogen. If insulin levels are high, this inhibits PKA. When PKA levels are high, this is going to inhibit the phosphatase. And so now you can kind of see that this is balanced. As I get more glucagon and epinephrine activating PKA, it'll overwhelm that phosphatase. As I get more in insulin, it'll cause the phosphatase to upregulate and it'll overwhelm PKA. And so is these two parts of the model here, the insulin and the glucagon, as those fluctuate in their secretion, we change the overall tone. I don't even really know what to call it. The overall, basically, the pre preference for the phosphorylase or the synthase. Does that make sense? Do I need to give you some more time here on the model? You're going to have to spend a little bit of time there, but the big thing is, is that we're activating either one of these enzymes based off of which of the hormones has a higher has a higher prevalence. And, and they're basically they're basically in this in this balance where insulin may begin to increase because glucose levels are getting low, glycogen increases, glucagon increases because insulin levels are getting I'm sorry, other way around too low and then insulin because it's too high and they're just kind of fluctuating back and forth. Turning on and off and changing how much activation and, and it's basically within a cell how many of these glycogen synthase enzymes, there's hundreds in the cell, how many of those phosphorylates, there's hundreds in the cell, how many of them are activated 
can efficiently catalyze their reaction. Does that make sense? Y'all are real responsive to that. I appreciate that. It is. Spend a little time with that. So moving on to the third hormone here, the insulin, what we've got, and then um, we're actually gonna we're gonna get into that a little bit. Um, right now, we're gonna talk about where how it inhibits. So it's gonna different forms. So give me just a second. That's a, that's a good question. So somatostatin has different forms. Somatostatin 14 is one of the forms, and we've already ran into somatostatin 14. It doesn't come into the model, Brenna, because it's happening outside of the cell. Okay, so somatostatin 14 increases, and this actually is going to inhibit glucagon in terms of glucagon's secretion. This is what's produced in the pancreatic T cells. That's where this glucagon. 14, I'm sorry, SMATSAT 14. So that model I just gave you, where was that? What cell? It's in the liver. Glucagon and insulin are being regulated by SMATSAT in the pancreas. And so SMATSAT 14 inhibits glucagon, will prevent its secretion. The second isoform is SMATSAT. Somatostatin 28. In somatostatin 28, about 10 to 20 percent of the central nervous system somatostatin is going to be somatostatin 28. Um, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. 10 to 20 percent of the somatostatin comes from the central nervous system for somatostatin 28. This is what we saw in the hypothalamus in the pituitary, that interaction. Most is from the small intestine. It will help to regulate some of the digestive processes. Half-life of somatostatin is roughly about three minutes, and that means that within 30 minutes, we would, uh, after secretion, somatostatin would no longer have a potent physiological about 10 half-lives to get to a point where, so 10 times 3 is 30 minutes, is to get to a point where it no longer had a potent uh, effect on, on the system. Okay, we also have pancreatic polypeptide. This is from the F cells of the pancreas, uh, the pancreatic islets. This is a 36 amino acid long peptide. Pancreatic polypeptide has the action of decreasing somatostatin. Pancreas. Remember the, the pancreatic islet? In the, so you had pancreatic islet and then the rest of this stuff out here was 
the asinar cells of the pancreas, that's the exocrine portion. And inside of the pancreatic islets, you had five different cell types, beta cells, alpha cells, D cells, um, the, the F cells. So it decreases the somatostatin that's being produced, so this is somatostatin 28 from the gut and the pancreas. Um, poly, the the uh, pancreatic polypeptide also stimulates pancreatic enzymes to upregulate chemical reactions um, during digestion uh, and in production of, of pancreatic chemicals. And then it also has been shown to have some sort of role in the movement of food through the GI tract. So it has this role in accumulating parasols and segmentation of the small intestine to help move that through the GI tract. So I, I, in the last 25 minutes here, what I want to do is I want to I want to talk about diabetes. Okay, so we've kind of moved away from all of the hormones. I know somatostatin, pancreatic polypeptide, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time there. Insulin and glucagon are the big pancreatic. Um, uh, hormones, and, and, and that's why I want to take a, a look here at diabetes mellitus or diabetes in general. And we'll talk about a couple different types of diabetes. Uh, but diabetes is a uh, pretty common disease. It has um, some misnomers. There's some things that um, you may believe about diabetes that may not be completely accurate. So I want to talk, spend a little bit of time here. Um, so you're all aware that we have diabetes that are typically referred to as diabetes type 1, diabetes type 2. Okay. This is specifically diabetes mellitus. There's other types of diabetes as well. There's gestational diabetes. There's another type of diabetes that we'll talk about. I think I'll talk about it. Maybe I won't. I guess I don't have anything. Well, I don't. But there's a, so we're going to specifically talk about diabetes mellitus, but there's a, another kind of type that's called diabetes insipidus. Uh, diabetes insipidus causes an increase in uh, urination, and literally it means uh, basically sweet urine. That's what diabetes means. It actually means the person who first characterized it from a diabetic dog dipped his finger. This is the, this is, this is the, the fairy tale, I guess. Dipped his finger in the urine, tasted it, it was sweet. So diabetes meant sweet tasting urine. This is that. So when we talk about diabetes, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, we're specifically talking about the type of diabetes that's known as diabetes mellitus. Okay? The type 1 diabetes mellitus is insulin, insulin dependent. Insulin dependent. So what does this exactly mean? It means that these individuals with type 1 diabetes, they do not have insulin or very, very little insulin in circulation. So how can an individual end up with little or no circulating insulin? And the answer is they have dysfunction of the beta cells. So the beta cells are no longer producing insulin to be released into the bloodstream. Okay? And we'll talk about that in just a second. But I do want to share that these individuals have very normal glucagon. Very normal glucagon. And so what that means is that insulin levels can just increase. They have a hormone that will increase glucose in the bloodstream. They don't have the, ins the hormone insulin that will counter that effect. And so these individuals will have to take some sort of um, some sort of insulin shot or medication, a pump, something like that, 
every time they need to bring glucose levels back down. So glucagon is normal, insulin is not normal. And it's a result of the destruction of the beta cells. Okay? The wall results in a destruction of the beta cells. And there's a there's a, a some nuances here that are really important. But let's start out with this destruction. How might I destroy my beta cells? Well, one of the ways I can destroy my beta cells is I can target them specifically as if they're foreign invasion cells, and then I'm going to destroy them, which is what's known as an autoimmune response. So I can lose my beta cells through autoimmune destruction. Basically, the, the beta cell is identified as a foreign invading cell. The immune system produces antibodies against the beta cell. The beta cell gets marked for destruction, and then the immune system goes through and destroys it. So when we look at the population of type 1 diabetics, it's estimated that the antibody-induced loss of the beta cells accounts for about 85% of that type 1 population. So about 80, 85%. So there's actually a second mechanism as well that can account for the remainder, uh, possibly. Uh, and, and it's referred to sometimes as a noxious exposure. Something happens in the in the health history of, of these other 15% where they have an infection. And often this has been a viral infection. Uh, now at some point there was kind of this hypothesis that there was some issues with milk back in the 1980s uh, and created this noxious exposure, this infection. Uh, Whatever happened here, this results in a toxic shock or insult to the system, and we lose the base. Okay. So whatever whatever the etiology is, however this happened, the beta cells are rendered functionless. They no longer can produce insulin. So it might be autoimmune induced. It might be because of some sort of infection the individual experienced earlier in life. Now, it also appears that there's a pretty heavy genetic predisposition. Genetic predisposition. So the studies that are used, or the type of um, experimental design used um, with genetic predisposition, a lot of times are twin studies. And what they'll do is twin studies, you'll have um, identical twins and then what are not identical twins called? Paternal? Okay. So you have identical and you have paternal. Identical twins are genetically identical. Paternal twins are as different as paternal. 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 <laughs> identical and not identical. <laughs> the the non-identical twins are as different as any other sibling pair. Okay? But they're born at the exact same time, and they develop with the exact same maternal environment. So the and, and they're hopefully, if they're raised in the same home, being raised in that same environment. So there's still some controls in there that between your identical and your non-identical. Environment's controlled. The environment's the same. So the, the main difference should be the genetics. Okay? And so what they do is they get a whole bunch of sample volunteers, identical, non-identical, and they start to look at phenotypes, and they start to look at what are the, what are the similarities and the differences. And so when they do this with type 1 diabetes, what they find is that in identical twins, so these are genetically identical, and individuals who grew up in identical environments, 
if one twin has type 1 diabetes, 30 to 40 percent of those pairings, the second twin has diabetes. Brenna, you know what I'm trying to do here. Identical. So identical twins, you end up with 30 to 40 percent. Now one twin has it, the second twin has it, which is actually relatively high. This is a pretty high incidence um, of, of the same type of, uh, of disease. And so it appears, based off of the data from twin studies, that there might be a genetic link. And so what has followed up is analysis of a gene that we find on chromosome 6. Chromosome 6. On chromosome 6 in humans, we have a gene that's called the major histocompatibility complex gene. Major histocompatibility complex gene. Uh, so the MHC genes. What the MHC genes do is they code for antigen expression. So they code for antigen expression. Uh, antigens, you'll remember, these are the markers that get put into the surface of the cell. In particular, these genes mark or produce an antigen called the human leukocyte antigens, or HLAs. Human leukocyte antigens. And again, these are just cell surface markers. Cell surface markers. So this would be an example of a human leukocyte antigen, the HLA. Uh, you can see that I have a couple different subunits. And these will be used to mark that cell as being a cell that is supposed to be present. So because they have different subunits, you can end up with different versions of these genes, different, um, those are my genetics, the two different versions of the gene. Um, Some people are homozygous, heterozygous, dominant percent, alleles. Good lord. <laughs> so because you have these different these different subunits, you can have different alleles that get combined to mark the surface of your cells. Okay? And so when we do a survey of the different combinations of the human leukocyte antigens, there's several different combinations. Things like human leukocyte antigen DR, human leukocyte antigen DQ, human leukocyte antigen DP, where each of these DR, DQ, and DP are different, different subunits of the, uh, of the cell surface marker. Now, each of these antigens becomes a target that can be marked by an antibody for destruction, to mark that cell for destruction. Now, normally, if they're supposed to be there, your body doesn't produce an antigen against that. However, in autoimmune diseases, 
those antigens that are supposed to be there, they get marked with an antibody for destruction. So that's what it looks like genetically. And so we also need to look at this phenotypically. So the outward expression. So within the human population, in terms of the human lymphocyte antigen, there's a bunch of different phenotypes or a bunch of different ways that these cell surface markers are expressed in the surface of your cells. So some of you may be HLA DR3 expressors. Okay, so that's the actual protein that you express in your cell surface. Or you may have HLA DR4. Individuals who express HLA DR3 or HLA DR4 actually see an elevated risk for type 1 diabetes. So there's something about DR3 and DR4 that predisposes an individual to get those marked by their immune system and destroyed by the immune system, and then they lose beta, uh, beta cell function. Individuals who express both HLA-DR3 and HLA-DR4 So not just either or, which has elevated risk, but both of these antigens are present on the surface of the cell. 95% of type 1 patients are genetically defined as HLA, DR3, DR4. Another combination or another phenotypic combination is to have HLA DQ and either the DR3 or the DR4 antigens. These individuals have some risk. But what's kind of interesting is that there's actually a phenotype where you have the proteins HLA. DQ and HLA DR2 that appears to be protective. It has very low, that, that type of um, combination it has a very low incidence of type 1 diabetes. Okay? So basically, each of these that I'm giving you, those acronyms, those are the proteins. Those proteins are in the membrane. And an individual who gets type 2 or type 1 diabetes will produce antibodies that bind to those proteins. They mark those cells as foreign invading cells. The immune system responds with destroying that cell. So once you've destroyed that cell and removed the beta cells, you no longer are going to be able to produce it. So these individuals, they have to take insulin shots or pumps after they eat meals. They'll measure glucose a couple times throughout the day with a glucometer uh, and will basically take up the function the uh, function of the pancreas by making decisions based off of evidence. Type 2 diabetes is non-insulin dependent. Okay, so what exactly does that mean? Well, non-insulin dependent actually means that they do not need insulin. These individuals, when they have an increase in blood glucose for a prolonged period of time, so they eat a real sugary diet, right? They have the so-called Western diet, the McDonald's diet. Every time they eat a meal that has high amounts of glucose, at the beginning of this process, high levels of insulin are released to counter 
the effects of that glucose. But as you progress, what happens here is we observe that there is a decrease in insulin. So at the beginning, they start eating a sugary diet. Insulin responds normally, but it remains relatively high because they're constantly inundating the blood with sugar. And as life progresses, now we begin to see insulin decrease. And so we end up with a reduced insulin response. And what that means in terms of glucose levels is glucose levels now remain especially high. So glucose levels continuously remain high in the bloodstream for prolonged periods of time. Uh, it's kind of like rock candy, right? The, the sugar starts to crystallize in the blood. It scrapes against the vessel wall. This causes damage. The natural response of vas vasculature is to repair that and basically to form a plaque over that scar tissue. That begins to reduce the diameter of those vessels, reduce the blood flow. If it happens in a place like the brain or the heart, it would be pretty problematic. Reduce blood flow to those organs. So this response, how, how, I mean, there's a lot of people who eat really sugary diets and they don't end up with diabetes. It turns out here there's a pretty large genetic component as well. So in our twin studies, identical twins, now we're looking at 75 to 80 percent. If one twin has type 2 diabetes, the second twin has type 2 diabetes. But it also appears that there's some pretty significant environmental components or effects as well. So just because you're not genetically be, uh, predisposed doesn't mean that you're immune to type 2 diabetes. Okay, so we have a large environmental component as well. So there is a group of native um, Indians or Native Americans, native, native Mexicans that live in the United States and also live in Mexico. Interestingly, the group that lives in the United States eats very, very differently than the group that lives in Mexico. So this makes a really unique opportunity for study because you have two people groups with similar genetics, but with two very different environments. So these are the Pima Indians. And they live in Arizona. In fact, you may have actually seen some stuff with the Pima Indians. They have a waterfall in Arizona on their land that they just recently restricted access to. I don't know if you've seen that in the news or not. So in the United States, in the state of Arizona, type 2 diabetes occurs at a very high incidence. Very high incidence. In Mexico, the population has a 0% incidence. So in the United States, Pima Indians, very, very high incidence of type 2 diabetes. In Mexico, a very, very low, different, different, uh, very low incidence or 0% incidence in the Mexican population. And turns out that their eating habits, they've studied their eating habits, they're very different. The Pima Indians are very traditional in Mexico and are very westernized in the United States. Lots of McDonald's, very So there is a pretty high genetic component, but there's also a very high environmental component as well. If you're exposed to high sugary diet throughout your life, you are at a higher presupposition for or predisposition for uh, type 2 diabetes, diabetes. Turns out that there's also risk factors for being uh, obese. So obese individuals and type 2 diabetes, when we looked at obese individuals 
60 to 70 percent of individuals who are obese have type 2 diabetes in North America, in Europe, and in Africa, which is kind of surprising. Uh, and most people are like, oh, well, there's not many uh, obese people in Africa. False. Actually, Europe and in Africa, higher rates of obesity than in the United States. Uh, access to low cost, high calorie foods, little uh, increasing industrialization of patterns, and less physical activity. Individuals in Japan who are obese, 30% are classified as uh, type 2 diabetes. And then 100% of Pacific Islanders and Pima Indians. If you are obese and have Pima, you're also probably type 2 diabetic or Pacific Islander, obese Pacific Islander, you're probably also a type 2 diabetic. And so there's a pretty heavy link between obesity and body size and type 2 diabetes. And so some of that, I'm out of time. Can I finish? Everybody okay? We'll take like three minutes. Okay, so body fat distribution turns out um, has some pretty big influence here. So if your body fat is distributed through your upper body, those cells in the upper body, they undergo hypertrophy, not hyperplasia. Hypertrophy means that the size of the cell increases. So if you gain weight in the upper body, the cell size increases. It's not hyperplasia, which is the number of cells. Now what happens here is as the cell gets bigger, remember that you have surface area to volume rate ratios. And so as the cell gets bigger, the volume outpaces the surface area, right? The result here is that there is a decrease in receptor density. A decrease in receptor density. So as those cells in the upper body increase, which adipose cells respond to insulin, you have less receptors per unit of volume in that cell. So a lower receptor density. And what ends up happening here is when we increase insulin, it has no or limited effect because of that reduced density. There's not enough receptors for that insulin to bind to. If I don't have enough insulin receptors for the insulin to bind to, I can't initiate that uptake of glucose as, as effectively. On the lower body side, Fat cells undergo hyperplasia, not hypertrophy. And so what happens here with hyperplasia is I get a new cell that's formed that's about the same size as other cells, and so I maintain my receptor density. So that receptor density remains unchanged, and so you have just as much uh, ability to respond to insulin because of the presence of those receptors.